Um, so, like Chris was saying, there's sort of um, this, well, when he first asked me to do this, I, I got really excited about it because this is something that I'm like, I'm, I'm fired up about. I love learning about this stuff, so I'm excited to be able uh, to present it to you guys. But I also sort of got, um, as I was going through this research and going through this stuff, it's really overwhelming and sort of one of the general things that you see a lot in the, in the media and in the, the literature that you see is that there are three things that, that are just volatile topics, and that's politics, religion, and nutrition. And so you get just all sorts of information from all over the place. Um, now I got more pressure because he said something about, about household nutrition, and I'm a single 24-year-old. So um, I, don't know, I don't know how to, how to feed a household. I can barely keep myself fed and clothed. So to, to be here and upright is, is a win for me. Um, but I am excited to be able to do this and to sort of explain um, the processes of, of, of how this works and, and why it works and then to sort of hopefully give you guys some takeaways that you can go home um, and apply. And that's the cool thing about this is, is that there's really no like, there's no time that you have to start for it to start working other than, than right now. And your, your next chance to start getting this right is with your next meal. And my dad's here, um, and which is kind of cool for me and he'll be real thrilled to know that um, I took some lessons away from the driving instruction that he did for me, which even though it doesn't really show in my record. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but one thing that he told me as I, as I was learning to drive, and this stuck with me, is that if you try to make corrections to every little error in your driving or every little swerve to the left or right or you know, turn to the left or right, that you're gonna end up making it worse. Um, so, so what I wanna think about is focusing on the big picture and sort of looking down the road. And that was the lesson that he taught me was that if you look at the horizon of your road, that you're gonna stay steadier. So rather than beat yourself up about one meal or one cupcake or one Oreo or whatever the case may be, it, as long as the general idea is right, you're on the right track. So that's sort of one of the, the main takeaways that I wanna that I want you guys to have from this, and that there is no real perfect way to do it. And you know, you get, um, just sort of by show of hands, who's, who's heard of or follows or um, in some way is connected to the paleo diet, just heard of it, um, regularly follows it. Okay, cool, that's, that's exciting. Um, so hopefully with today you'll understand why, um, why CrossFit sort of goes that way with, with their nutrition um, and, and why why it makes sense. Um, so CrossFit in general, you can sort of, those of you who are involved with, with CrossFit, especially here, you sort of see that CrossFit is, is different, um, is, is a little bit contrarian. Um, it, it tends to argue with, with sort of the mainstream. And it does that, way, that in nutrition too, because you get the, the FDA requirements or the FDA recommendations that you get a certain number of whole grains, you get all this stuff. And CrossFit sort of says, well, let's take a look back and let's look at the facts. And so what I want to do is take a look back millions of years and sort of see where we came from and, uh, and, and where that puts us now. So what we've got, and this is the Paleo diet named after the Paleolithic um, era, which occurred, and this is space number one on your sheets if you want to fill this in. Um, the Paleolithic period, um, I'll just stick with Paleo, happened from roughly 2.6 million years ago. And that number comes from the time when the first human-ish creatures showed up on Earth. Um, that's when the earliest hominids showed up on Earth. That's 2.6 million years ago, up until 10,000 years ago. So you're still talking, over this period, you're still talking about roughly 2.6 million years. T taking 10,000 away from that really doesn't do a whole lot to that 2.6 million. And uh, to sort of illustrate that, and to illustrate sort of what, what this time frame means, um, and what that 10,000 represents is that's when agriculture showed up. That's when we started putting seeds into the ground, pulling them up and harvesting them as plants. So uh, for, our own, for our own feeding purposes. So you've got 2.6 million years to 10,000 years ago. And during this entire period, we were in some form of hunter-gatherer mode. And these are people um, who are more or less genetically identical to ourselves. And that's one of the other spaces. And I'll touch, touch back on that in just a second. But uh, more or less genetically identical to ourselves. So, what that means is for us to take the things that they did starting 2.6 million years ago all the way up to 10,000 years ago, 
It, it means that it, it, it works for us. It's how we evolved. It's, it's 100,000 generations of adaptation and evolution. And so to sort of really get across what that means, I want to um, step outside and sort of show you on a continuum and on a distance. So if you would, uh, let's stand up and let's walk outside. So this is going to equal 100 yards. It's the length of a football field. So football fans, hang with me on this. So I'm going straight ahead. And we're going to keep going until I get to 300 feet. And we're going to make a couple of stops along the way. But they're not going to happen for a long time. So I'm at... I'm at 50 feet now. Coming up on 100 feet. And once I get around 100, 150 feet, we're talking about millions of years. And I'm gonna stop right here. When Chris asked me to do this, I was actually really worried that I wasn't gonna be able to fill up enough time. But Chris, I've filled up now a couple million years. So <laughs> I, think I've, I think I've met my time requirements. So let's keep going. I keep going. All right, so right here, this is 150 feet, and you can look back and you can see the kettlebell. This is roughly 2.6, it's roughly 1.3 million years that we've covered in the space that, that we've walked. So you've had a busy afternoon. Now, as I get down here, coming up on 200, right there for me sweetheart perfect a little towards me every inch matters right there good and there we go 300 will you put that kettlebell right next to there we go okay so you can look back and you can see that kettlebell where it started where she is standing to right here this is 10,000 years ago until when until where we are right now so this is this space right here this foot and a half is how much time we have actively farmed for our food for all of that space every inch of that we were hunter gatherers so wouldn't it make sense that we're way better at that and way better at handling that kind of that kind of eating and that kind of diet than this kind of diet now i'll take it a step further we hold that if I were to take, and this is not exactly 300 yards, but, or I'm sorry, 100 yards, but if I were to take the last fifth of the last inch before that 300 yard mile, I mean, we're talking, we're talking this much space. That's 100 years. And what that means is that's the time that we've been processing our food, meaning we've been milling, you know, flour via factory, or we've been, you know, doing all the things putting hormones into our food, putting steroids into our meat, things that making, making Oreos. Like that's, that's the time that like, that we're talking about. It's nothing. Our bodies like, th this is what I'm, what I'm going to get to is that our bodies treat this more or less as a foreign invader. They don't know what to do with it because we've got that much time to evolve to eating meat, vegetables, nuts, and seeds, a little bit of fruit when it was seasonal a little starch from like sweet potatoes maybe and no sugar there were no added sweeteners cavemen didn't put splenda on anything it just it just <laughs> didn't happen i mean like if they found a strawberry that was plenty sweet enough and they they dug it so um so that's sort of a, a graphic representation of why our bodies want to eat this way it's because it's 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 a millions and millions of years of adaptation so that's sort of it, it, when I sort of figured that out and got that analogy, that's, that sort of slaps you in the face a little bit. I mean, that is a significant amount of time where we didn't eat anything that we're being told to eat now. So that said, let's head back inside. So sort of to see what, what this diet looked like and what, what it meant for people, um, there's a study that I read about where they took um, a, a family of Aboriginal Australians who, and this happened in the 1980s, who grew up in the brush, basically. They grew up as hunter-gatherers, as modern hunter-gatherers, and they moved at one point in their life, while their kids were young, they moved into Sydney. 
And while they lived in Sydney, they started consuming food the way that modern Westerners consume food. And over time, they got fat. They got, they, all these health issues showed up and, uh, and they, they got fat and they got unhealthy. And so what, what the study was, was they took these same people and they put them back into the environment that they came from. They put them back into that hunter-gatherer, that atmosphere, and they told them for seven weeks, we need you to hunt and gather your own food, um, live as though you lived in the brush, uh, activity levels, you know, we're not asking you to do any kind of exercise. And what happened was based on, or depending on where they live, um, they ended up by, by scavenging and hunting and, and gathering their own food, they ended up eating a diet that was roughly 54 to 80 percent protein. It was 13 to 40 percent fat, and it was somewhere between 5 and 33 percent carb. I'm going to talk more about what that means here in a little bit, but the takeaway is that these people who lived basically like m most Americans lived, they went into the brush, hunted and gathered their own food, and ate the foods that are readily available in the grocery store, the, the meats, the vegetables, nuts and seeds, some fruit, little starch, no sugar. And they, their, their health normalized, their, their cholesterol levels, their blood pressure levels, all those things, they lost weight. That all normalized in seven weeks. And this sort of, this framework right here is completely flipped from what most modern sources will tell you, which is get healthy whole grains, limit your fats and eat, eat, you know, marginal or, you know, moderate amounts of protein. So they sort of flip that script. This is not a new phenomenon. It's not a new diet. This is the actual, the first, the first diet book that was, that was ever published, a guy named William Banting um, in Great Britain in the 1860s, who was a real fat dude. Um, and he tried everything that he could to lose weight and eventually went to a doctor who told him, quote, uh, to avoid milk, bread, sugar, and potatoes, and to eat to fullness, meat, fish, vegetables, nuts, and seeds. In 38 weeks, he lost 35 pounds. He wrote the then Amazon.com number one bestseller. Um, they didn't have Amazon, I'm just kidding. You can laugh. Um, Banting's Letter on Corpulence, which is the first best-selling diet book in history. So it was basically a paleo diet book. It was limit your starchy carbohydrates, limit your sugar, eat meat and vegetables, nuts and seeds. So that's sort of the, the background of this. I'm also going to talk, um, once I get sort of past the history, I'm going I'm to sort of skim over or touch the surface of some, some biological things. The way that our body actually responds to the food that we eat, the way that our body um, perceives it and, and adapts to it. So I'm going to sort of get into uh, into the history of stuff now. Uh, I talked about sort of the distance of time that we're talking about. Um, I talked about what, what hunter-gatherers would have eaten. But here's sort of where, where we go, is you don't care what a caveman ate. We are, we are more concerned with our own health than we are about history. It's a fantastic history lesson to say, oh, cave people ate you know, whatever they could find and whatever they could dig up out of the ground. But it doesn't, it doesn't do much for us until we learn how to apply it to ourselves. So what, what I want you to know is that it's not, it's not that we don't eat cupcakes because cavemen didn't have cupcakes and so we shouldn't eat cupcakes because of that. It's because if a caveman found a cupcake in the wild, he certainly would have enjoyed it. But, but what I'm saying is that, that we don't eat that stuff because they didn't eat it and because this is, this is how we evolved. This is how, this is how, it, how we got to, the, to where we are now and this is how we evolved to respond to food. Like I said, for all intents and purposes, we are identical to our Paleolithic ancestors. They are the same as we are. They had the capability of speech. Um, they buried their dead. They had um, art. They had music. They had conversations. They just had a different lifestyle than we had. Um, they had, because of the food that they ate, and because, and I'm going to talk sort of more about this in the biology section, but because the food that they ate, the wild game that they ate, was eating the food that it was designed to eat. This is, we're not alone in, in our responses to the wrong food. If you feed a cow grains, it has an adverse reaction in its body. Cows don't eat grains, cows eat grass. So when you feed a cow grains, 
and then you feed a human that cow, you're getting the, the tangent problems that that cow got from eating those grains, which is why you get the idea of grass-fed meats or free-range chickens or cage-free tomatoes. <laughs> um, so, you know, I mean, that's, if, you, if you put an animal as close as you can to its natural habitat, it is the best thing for us to eat. So that's sort of where, where I want to go with that. Um, we have evolved very little in the way of adaptation to carbohydrate, meaning the grains and the, the sugars, we didn't eat very much of it, so our bodies treat it as, as a foreign body. Our bodies treat it as something that doesn't belong, treat it as something that shouldn't be there. So that's sort of why we cut out the starchy carbohydrates. Now, when you think about carbohydrates, most people think, like, give me, give me examples of some carbohydrates. Bread. Show me. Bread, pasta, Potato. cereal. Keep going. I mean, potatoes. potatoes, sugar. What about broccoli? No. Yes. <laughs> Cam, do you like broccoli? Yeah. Broccoli is a carbohydrate. Apple is a carbohydrate. Um, all of these things, the vegetables that we eat, those are carbohydrates. So whether we eat our carbohydrates as as broccoli or as celery or as whole grain bread or as refined white bread or as Oreos, it doesn't matter, it's all carbohydrate. And what your body does is it takes it and it breaks it down, depending on the complexity of the carbohydrate, it breaks it down into its simplest form, which is, what's the simplest form of a carbohydrate? Anybody know? Sugar, right? Our body breaks it down into sugar. It breaks it down into, depending on what it is, it breaks it down into either glucose or fructose. So we don't have really the adaptation to respond to, uh, to carbohydrate in, in the grain form. We've done We've done a great job of getting used to eating fruits and vegetables, but, but the grains we don't, we don't do so well with because we haven't ever done it. Um, there is abundant evidence. There is there's tons of evidence to suggest that, and I want to say this exactly right, that many modern disease processes, diseases, what we call diseases of civilization, diseases that occur as soon as we started all congregating as groups, as, as societies, and farming our food. There is abundant evidence that many modern diseases of civilization, including cardiovascular disease, elevated triglycerides, obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, hypoglycemia, and cancer, are not the product, as you'll hear, of excess fat in the diet, but of excess carbohydrates that we don't know how to respond to. So that's, that's huge. Um, the other factors that are included are trans fats, um, which, are, which are not they don't occur in nature, they're, they're factory created fats. Um, and then the, the difference between where, where we are and where our predecessors were as far as the balance between our omega-3 fatty acids and our omega-6 fatty acids. And what that means is these are types of fatty acids that are produced in wild meat. So any grass-fed animal that you eat, um, any, any game if you hunt, um, has, has a higher concentration than, uh, than any farm-raised or factory-raised animal of that omega-3, which is the fish oil product placement um, that you can get for the low, low price. I don't know what it costs, but, um, but the fish oil, it's omega-3, and it is, it is the reason that our brains grew to the size that they grew and that we stopped scavenging for our food and started hunting for our food and eventually the reason that we started being able to have conversation or to create music or whatever. This is, I mean, this is what took us from Neanderthal up to modern human. So omega-3 is just huge, which is another, another argument for the, for the, the grass-fed, the, the animal eating what it's supposed to eat. Now, to take sort of a look at what a paleo or a, a, a pre-human, pre-modern human life would have looked like, there was lower life expectancy, which if you talk about the paleo diet, the, the argument that you're going to hear is, well, they only lived to be 40 years old. How could it be healthier for you? The reason that it's healthier for you is because you've got, you've got the responsibility and the burden of providing food for your entire societal group on your shoulders, particularly if you're a man, and if you fall and break your leg while you're hunting a mammoth, which fights back, you're out of luck. Like, you don't, you don't feed your family anymore. So of course you don't live past 40, but what there is evidence of is 
Average life expectancy is a real misleading statistic because you've got people who die at 22 because they got eaten by a saber-toothed tiger. And then you've got people who live to the good old age of 70 in remarkable health. So you're living in a world without antibiotics or you're living in a world without, you know, without any modern medicine, but you're living in a world where the people who are alive are living in just enormously healthy lifestyle. So that's, that's sort of the, the counter argument is cavemen were just as liable and just as clumsy to slip in a river and not be able to provide food for their family as we would be. They just didn't have workers comp. So, um, so that's sort of where we want to go with that. Biologically, um, I want to talk about what food is. Food. Food is a complex set of complex molecules. You'll hear a lot of people talk about things like, or say things like, I eat whole grain bread for the fiber. I drink milk for the calcium. But what you've got is you've got food. You take a, a strawberry and it's got a certain number of carbohydrate grams, it's got, you know, it's got whatever it's got, but it has a multitude of micronutrients. And that's, I think, the next space, one of the next spaces. Food is divided into two main categories, and your two main categories are your macronutrients and your micronutrients. Your micronutrients are your vitamins, your minerals, your, your phytonutrients, like beta carotene. Those are your micronutrients, and there's hundreds of them. So to create a synthetic food or a processed food that matches what happens in nature is just an unrealistic thing to expect because it's so complex and it, 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 it works all together. The, the micronutrients have just tons and tons of purposes. They, they protect against free radicals in your body. They, they promote an immune response. They, they, they work for DNA repair. I mean, there's just all these things that they do, and they're, they're set up so that the food that you eat that is food, that's human food that we've, that we've adapted to processing, it, it's, it's all working together to do the right thing that it's supposed to do for you. So by taking, uh, you know, by adding in, you look at, you know, enriched bread or, or things like that where they add back in nutrients, that's, that's sort of a calculated thing where the calculations have already been done and the, the options for that, that perfect balance are just your whole foods. So that's sort of where, where you need to sort of remember with that. Your macronutrients, these are the ones that everybody's familiar with. This is your protein, your carbohydrates, and your fat. So um, these have, have a whole lot of uh, purposes. Um, they're used, they're com consumed in large amounts, um, necessary for growth, they're necessary for metabolism. They're, there are tons of functions that your, your fat, protein and carbohydrates perform. Um, they supply energy, carbohydrates do. Um, they're structural components, your proteins are. Um, fat serves as a transmitter throughout your body. They're all important. So to call even the paleo diet, to call it a low carb diet, really kind of does it a disservice because it is a balanced diet of what we're actually supposed to eat. So I'm not saying restrict your carbohydrate intake, I'm saying restrict the types of carbohydrates that you intake. Carbohydrates, like I said before, whether it's from a carrot, whether it's from brown rice, whether it's from a Pop-Tart, it all breaks down into sugar. Whether, when it goes into my body, it becomes sugar. My body breaks it down, it digests it into simplest sugars. Um, it is a universal energy source. Uh, it's, it's easily used by most cells in the body. Your body knows exactly what to do with carbohydrates. It takes it and it, and it, it handles it. It uses it as energy, um, quick energy, which is why after your workout, what happens is your, and I'll talk more about this, your glycogen stores, which is your stores of sugar in your cells, are depleted. You're using those cells, you're using those energy, or uh, that energy for your workout. Which is why if you go home after your workout and eat a banana or an apple or drink some juice, it rejuvenates you real, real, real quick. You're replenishing those glycogen stores, you're getting back to zero. Proteins are made up of amino acids. Um, they are the building blocks for all kinds of structure in the body, muscles, tendons, ligaments, skin, hair, bones, teeth, um, are, are all made up of protein. Um, bones and teeth a little bit less, but all the ones before that, absolutely. Fats, they're, uh, they're free form, which are your free fatty acids or built into complexes, which are your saturated fats. Um, they, they allow you to absorb fat soluble vitamins, transport nutrients across cell membranes, and maintain your immune function. So a low fat diet, 
screws you up. It, it messes with you. Um, they're the building blocks for your brain tissue, your nerve fibers. They're an excellent slow burning energy source. Fats consumed, especially early in the day, set you right for the rest of the day. They, they are a source of energy that your body can draw from all day long. Um, they, they support lower intensity activity, your, your day at work, um, your, you know, going and picking up the kids from school, like whatever, whatever you're doing, fats are good for that. Carbohydrates aren't good for that. Carbohydrates will get you, get you revved up and then they'll send you right back down. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna have some carbohydrates right before a workout, cool. If you're gonna have some fats right before a workout, a big handful of almonds, doesn't really do much for you. It's, it's a longer, it's a slower burn. Um, a calorie. A calorie is, this is I think one of your spaces, the energy contained within each type of micronutrient. I'm sorry, macronutrient. And so here's where the low fat diet thing comes from. Because every gram of carbohydrate contains four calories. Every gram of protein contains four calories. Every gram of fat contains nine calories. Which means that modern, modern science or modern marketing has said, well, weight loss is as simple as calories in should be lower than calories out. So if I take the most calorically dense macronutrient, which is fat, and I cut it out, I'm gonna be taking in fewer calories and I'm gonna lose weight. It's not that simple because this is where the, the hormonal response to food kicks in. It's not as simple as just if I eat, if I eat 2,000 calories and burn 2,100 calories, I'm in a you know, 100 calorie deficit and I'm starting to lose weight. It doesn't happen that way over the long term. Correct, that's, that makes sense and that, that's how it works in the short term. But you can't sustain a caloric deficit. You're, you're running on less energy than you have. It's impossible. You, that's when you start giving into those cravings. It's when you start giving into the, you know, the eating the wrong food. So our bodies need a way, and this is an, another evolutionary adaptation, our bodies need a way to signal us that the food that we're eating is nutritious. If you look at foods that you find in nature, sweet foods are foods that provide a safe sort of source of energy. You look at foods like strawberries, you look at foods that like any of your fruits that are safe to eat, you look at those, they're sweet. Any vegetable, compared to, you know, <laughs> compared to an Oreo, again, they're not, and I want to talk more about that, but any vegetable, it has a sweet taste to it. It is a signal in nature that we receive that it's safe to eat. That's a, it's, a, it's an evolutionary adaptation. Fat food, fatty foods, meats, they are, they promote satiety, they promote fullness. So you get that signal from those fatty foods that this is a food that has that, that, um, that fatty ten flavor to it, that this is a food that will make me full quickly. This is a dense food. Any salty foods, you look at, um, you look at fish, you look at any, anything from the ocean, it promotes water retention. So those are signals that we receive in nature, but what's happened is modern food science has taken those foods or taken those signals and manipulated us to the point where we receive those signals without any of the nutrients or the nutrition that accompanies those signals in nature. So we've got, we've got super sweet foods and we, we get this signal from, from that strawberry that when we eat it, it's like, oh, this is good. This is a good source of energy. I'm going to keep eating this. And then we have that same signal that this is sweet. It's a good source of energy, but it's hyper sweet. It's like the, it's, it's, it's too much. It's an overload. And so we get into that. I'm going to, I'm going to keep eating this. Now what happens is when we eat that strawberry and I'm going to keep coming back to that strawberry. Um, and I, I might switch it up in just a second, but that strawberry versus that Oreo. When I eat that strawberry, I start getting signals from my body that tell me at the same time that I'm processing the nutrition, I get signals from my body, from my intestines that go to my brain that say, I'm, I'm starting to get all the nutrition that I require. I'm starting to, I'm starting to be satisfied, be satiated. Um, and at the same time, I'm not really getting, I mean, nobody's ever eaten so many strawberry or I, I haven't. So many strawberries that it's just like, I'm going to be sick off strawberries. Like, but you can eat, y'all, I can't have a pack of Oreos in my house. Because if I eat an Oreo, what's the next thing you want? 
an Oreo, and I want and I want the I want the twentieth Oreo as much as I wanted the first Oreo. And the reason is because I'm getting these signals from my body that this is sweet, this is good, this is like. But I'm not getting the signals that I'm new. I, I, I'm I'm fully. I'm getting the nutrition that I need. So the Oreos are are telling me like, yeah, keep getting some Oreos. But you eat like now. Let's talk about like a prime rib. If I have a prime rib in front of me, that first bite, oh man, first bite of a prime rib, uh, that's good. Second bite of a prime rib, yeah. Third bite, okay. Ooh. Tenth bite of a prime rib, all right. You know, and then like by the time you've got tw your 20 bites deep into a prime rib, you're going, I'm done. You know, and it's not a, it's not a like, God, I'm gonna be sick off prime rib. It's just I've gotten what I need to out of this prime rib, so I'm, I'm good. I don't have to eat anymore but I don't get those signals from an onion ring. I don't get those signals from an Oreo. I don't get those signals from a Pop-Tart. I get, I get the taste and I get the flavor and I get that like, this is good, but I don't get the, this is good. You know, that's, and that's, that's the big difference is the brain response and, and the body response. And the body response, you want those to match up. So that's where your whole foods are coming in. So let's look at, uh, let's look at hormones. The, the three hormones, that's the next thing. Yeah. The three hormones that I'm looking at today, and I'm, if this flies over your head, okay, because it, it's, it's complicated, but I want to sort of make sure that everybody understands it, and I'm going to try to package it as neatly as I can so that you guys understand it. Um, but the three hormones I want you to remember are this. Number one, insulin. Number two, it's going to be leptin. And number three, glucagon. Sounds like the Avengers. <laughs> All right, so I got insulin, I got leptin, I got glucagon. Here's what hormones are. Hormones are messengers that are designed or that are in your body that serve an individual purpose but work in conjunction with each other. Every hormone has a balancing hormone, every hormone has hormones that it works in conjunction with, and every hormone has a specific purpose. Now, what, what happens is that your hormones are created somewhere in your body. Insulin, for instance, and glucagon are created in your pancreas. They're secreted by your pancreas based on different triggers, external triggers. In this case, it's the food that you eat or different lifestyle habits. They're secreted by your pancreas and they, they bind to receptors all over your body. So they go all over your body. Insulin is a storage hormone. What that means is that its job is to unlock doors into your cells, not out of your cells. It only does one thing. It, it, it is highly specialized labor. It unlocks doors into your cells and puts stuff in them. It takes the simple sugar out of your bloodstream and it puts those sugars into your cells, into your muscle cells, into your liver cells, and then once those are filled up, puts it into your fat cells. So a, a huge insulin response, too much insulin is, is where we get fat from, body fat. Now, hormones in general, their job is to keep everything in balance, keep everything in equilibrium. Think about a thermostat. If my temperature in here were to get too cold, like 20 is when Chris turns on the heat. Um, when, <laughs> when it gets too cold, the thermostat kicks in and it brings the temperature up. If it gets too hot, the air conditioner kicks in and it brings it back down. So that's the idea with hormones, is they're trying to keep everything in balance. And that's, that's one of your sheets, or one of your, one of your things. Now, like I said, they're triggered by external triggers. Just like the thermostat, the heater is triggered by, my, by opening a window during the winter time. That's going to eventually lead to, me, to my heater cranking on. Insulin is going to be produced when my blood sugar is too high. So let's, let's talk air conditioner with insulin. So if the temperature gets too high, air conditioner comes on. If blood sugar gets too high, insulin gets secreted, it goes through your bloodstream, it picks up the sugar, it deposits it, it, deposits it into your cells to make sure that your blood sugar level stays normalized. So insulin is a result of carbohydrate intake. That's what, that's what, that's what causes my blood sugar to go up because all carbohydrates are broken down into sugars. Now, if it moves fat, carbohydrates, and protein from blood into cells for use and coordinates the shift 
from burning one fuel source, which is your carbohydrates, into burning the other fuel source which you have. What's the other fuel source you can burn other than carbohydrates? Stored body fat, right? So it is as close to, as you can get to a master hormone. It is, it is it's responsible for so, so many functions through your body. Now, like I said, it unlocks that one-way door into your cells. It doesn't do anything about letting things out of your cells. It's specialized labor. Now, what happens is it stores in the liver and in the muscles as glycogen. Storage is limited in your liver and in your muscles. Unless you're me, I got giant muscles and tons of storage. So, if there's, if there's an excess of insulin and an excess of blood sugar, it runs out of places in the liver and runs out of places in the muscles to store that stuff. So what does it do? It takes that sugar and it puts it back into your system, converts it into triglycerides and stores it, stores it as body fat. Now, what happens is that your body chooses the plentiful resource to burn first. So if I'm in here and I am busting my butt doing some thrusters or jumping up on a box, going and going and going, if I've eaten a really, really carb heavy meal before I come in here, my body goes, oh cool, I've got all this carbohydrate that I can burn and I can just torch this stuff and I'm okay, but it doesn't ever draw into your stored body fat. So it doesn't ever take that body fat and go, I'm gonna use this as my fuel source. And they're, they're equal fuel sources. They're, they're perfectly well suited, either one can do both. So insulin, insulin production is a result of blood sugar increases. Now, leptin is here. It is a satiety hormone. It signals to your brain, I'm full. You can stop eating now. It's responsible for signaling body fat levels, which drives hunger, it drives energy levels. If leptin levels are high, your body wants to eat less and it wants to move more. This is why when, uh, when you eat a, a real high carbohydrate meal, you get that like, woo, I'm, I'm good, and then you get that, that drop back down into it. Now, if leptin level, levels are low, it's the opposite. As body, fat, as body fat triglycerides and blood glucose go up, the body becomes leptin resistant. The body starts hearing this, this leptin and, and, and eventually it, it says it too much. It says, I'm fat, I'm fat, I'm fat, I'm fat, I'm fat. Or, I'm sorry, scratch that. It says, I'm too skinny. Your body says, I'm, I, I'm gonna... There we go. Scratch this. Okay, if, left, if leptin levels are low, the opposite is happening. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a boy who cried wolf thing. Um, when my insulin goes up, it's storing all this, all this sugar into my cells, and my leptin levels are going up. So I'm getting this signal in my body that my body fat's too low, and the leptin levels are going up. I'm becoming leptin resistant, and so my brain wants to keep eating. It's telling myself the wrong thing. So I'm, I'm eating more and more and more, and I'm storing more blood glucose. Now, your glucagon, this is your system that's taking those cells, it's taking the sugar out of those cells, and it's putting them back to work. So this is sort of like, it's here to save the day. This glucagon is coming back, and it's, it's drawing from your cells and, and using those as energy. It allows access to your stored energy in your liver, liver and fat cells, and it's stimulated by stress, including physical stress, so jumping up on a box, it's stimulated by protein consumption, and it's stimulated by low blood sugar. So if my blood sugar gets low, this is the heater. This is, this is glucagon coming in and saying, I need to take blood sugar out of my cells, put it back into my bloodstream, and use it as, as energy. So if insulin's high, stuff is being stored as fat. Insulin is promoted by carbohydrate intake. If insulin's low, then glucagon is being promoted, and that means low carbohydrate. It means I'm taking food from from my cells and using it as energy. So the, the, the takeaway here is this. High carbohydrate means I store food in my cells. Low <laughs> carbohydrate means I draw food from my cells. That's basically as simple as it can get. Now, um, talking about specific foods, talking about sugar. Sugar is obviously not healthy. I talked about how cavemen would never have put Splenda on anything. They never would have put added sugar on anything. They didn't have it. So, um, just sort of as a as a, sort of a note to make, artificial sweeteners um, are are not a better option. They're they're completely devoid of all nutrition. They're just they're just they're chemicals. Um, aspartame, for instance, um, is 200 to 300 times sweeter than sugar. It it has no application um, 
except to make my food sweet, and my body treats it as a foreign invader. Splenda is 600 times sweeter than sugar. Saccharin is 700 times sweeter than sugar, which is like your sweet and low. Plus, they're linked to cancer, they're linked to migraines, they're linked to kidney disorder, they're linked to carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, sugar on your, uh, on your sheet, sugar is the simplest carbohydrate. So, when you talk about sugar, there are, there are no nutrients that come with sugar. There's none of the micronutrients, there's none of the, it's only, the only application for sugar is added calories into my body. So if, I, if I'm starving to death and I have, I have terribly low blood sugar, I can, eat, I can eat added sugar and I won't die. Like that's, that's the, the practical application of sugar, which is to say not much. Um, talking about alcohol, and this is one that, uh, that, that I wanna get all over. Um, alcohol has, and again, this is sort of focusing on the, the long-term picture. In the short term, alcohol has no redeeming quality nutritionally. There is, there is absolutely zero reason to ever drink alcohol in any form nutritionally. Alcohol leads to bad decisions, and this is it. Here's, here's where I'm gonna go with this. Alcohol leads to bad food decisions. The other bad decisions are a completely different seminar. That's, and I'm not, I'm not good at that one. So, um, the uh, alcohol leads to bad food decisions and we've all been in a place, we've all been in a place where, where we, have, we have the alcohol and we eat whatever we want right then because it's sort of like whatever. And then the next day, eat whatever you want because Whatever. You know, and it's just like there's no there's no time where you where you drink your alcohol and go, all right, I'm staying on track tonight. I mean it just doesn't it just doesn't happen. So and nutritionally, alcohol as a as a chemical, as a compound, has twice as many car or twice as many calories per gram as sugar does. It's got eight eight calories per gram of alcohol. So listen, I'm not I'm not gonna tell you like you can't drink, but this is that like this is that looking down the horizon thing. There's there's t there's good and bad. It's a social. I mean, like whatever. This, that's the that's the science nutritionally of alcohol, and that's as far as I'm gonna go with it. Um, I'm sorry. If you're gonna drink, what should you drink? Water. I mean, like, <laughs> no. Okay. When you say drink, you mean if you're gonna drink alcohol. If you're gonna drink alcohol, here's where you go. You go. Um, so talking about what alcohol is, look at, look at whiskey, look at rum, look at beer, look at um, vodka, cool. So whiskey is derived from grain. It is a wheat-based product. Um, wine is derived from grapes, so we're okay, we're okay. Um, tequila is derived from agave, it is a plant. If you drink 100% agave tequila, if you drink tequila, you know, plastic bottle tequila, you're, you're, taking, you're taking a real risk. Um, rum is derived from cane sugar. It's derived from sugar cane. Um, vodka was the other one, derived from potatoes. So not, not ideal. Um, beer, derived from wheat. So it, you, look at, you look at what, what, it, what it comes from. You look at your source of your food and that's, that's sort of where, where you're gonna make your best decisions in the long run anyway, is if you, take, if you take the source of your food and sort of apply it. But the more you can do, or the more you do to your food, the less like the natural food it is. So wine is not very similar to grapes because of all that's happened to it. Wine coolers are even less similar to grapes, right? Will loves his wine coolers though. <laughs> but, uh, no, I'm saying, and, and, the more you can do to your food, the, you know, the less like food it is. So that's, that's sort of been, I'll get into that in, in the practical in just a second. Um, now this is sort of the oh, one that, that most people sort of fight on, grains. Um, here's the thing with grains, y'all. When you eat a grain, like whose favorite meal in here is a slice of bread? <laughs> just bread, like nothing on it, bread. Like, just to take it off the loaf, and buy, like, it's not, like, people eat grains, pasta, like dry pasta, a cup of oats. Like, it's not, like, that's, that's not what you want. Like, you want grains for the stuff that you put in it. Like, I want a sandwich for the lettuce and tomato and ham and cheese and all that. Like, eat that stuff. 
Like if you're like that's there's no reason for the grain. It's just it's it's an edible plate most of the time. Like it's or it mixes in. Like you take you take the the grain and if you isolate the grain, it's not nearly as desirable. But when you take the bread and you put like honey and butter and like all this stuff on it, or you take the you know I mean you take the pasta and you put marinara sauce and some meat on it and some onions and like put you know a little bit of garlic in there now you're talking about a meal just take the pasta out eat the marinara with the meat and the garlic and the onions like good you're done like that's that's it that's it. i mean that's as simple as i know how to make it like the the oatmeal put your blueberries in it eat your blueberries <laughs> like that's 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 kind of it it's but it's sort of from a science standpoint here's here's what a grain looks like a whole grain um i'm really good at drawing so check this out Okay, so there's three parts to a grain. That's a grain. Now, think about what a grain is. A grain is a seed of a grass plant. Now, grass plants don't have babies, so we can eat them. Any, 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 any living organism has two purposes, and it is survival and replication. That's, that's the purpose of, you, I mean, a lion wants to eat gazelles to survive, and it wants to make more lions. A, a human wants to live to be old, and it wants a bunch of kids. I mean, like, it's, it's survival and replication. Those are, those are hugely powerful triggers for anything, for a, for a blade of grass. That, it wants the same thing. It wants to continue to be a blade of grass. It doesn't want to die. So the three parts... Um, of a grain, and I'm going to draw this shell on the outside. This is the bran. Bran is the shell that a grain comes in. Right here, this is the germ. And it is the part that grows into the plant. Pre plant. And then right here, this is called endosperm, and it's the food. It is what this eats while this protects it and while it grows. That's basically what it is. So to make a refined grain, white bread, white pasta, instant oatmeal, you're taking away the bran and you're taking away the, the germ, and so you're left with this like little food nugget right here. But that doesn't like that's that's not food for us. It's food for a blade of grass. So it's it goes back to that like we're not supposed to eat it thing. Now, when you take away the bran and you take away the germ, you're taking away most of the nutrients, but you're not taking away any of the calories because this is the food. So you're leaving those calories in there, but it's just empty calories, which is why you hear that like white bread is empty calories. So white bread, instant oatmeal, snack food, dessert, it, it has the water sucked out, it's replaced with sugar, it's replaced with fat, it's replaced with salt, there's no fiber left so it's easily digested, which means it easily goes into our bloodstream, easily becomes glucose, easily gets stored as fat. Now, the processing doesn't leave any protein, it doesn't leave any of the nutrients. The argument for whole grains is this, it has a lower glycemic index. The glycemic index is the speed at which any given food raises my blood sugar. So a cupcake has a way higher glycemic index than a stalk of broccoli. Both of them, however, are carbohydrate. So the cupcake sends my blood sugar way up through the roof. The, the broccoli does it much slower, and it comes down a lot, fa a lot slower, too. So the lower glycemic index is the argument for whole foods, plus the fiber and all that stuff. But it doesn't address that they contain in here and in here. They contain enzymes. That are, that are defense mechanisms of the plant. Like I said, we haven't eaten wheat all that long. Remember the illustration, like we've eaten, we've eaten broccoli and strawberries for this long, we've eaten wheat for this long. Our bodies haven't adapted to it. The, like any plant, it has defense mechanisms. Like any animal, it has defense mechanisms. And our bodies can't handle it. Our bodies don't know what to do with it. It goes into, and I didn't even touch on the, the inflammation issues or what's called leaky gut syndrome, which is as gross as it sounds. Like, I mean, and these are all things that come from overconsumption of, of carbohydrates and especially overconsumption of grain carbohydrates. Um, so that's sort of the argument against grain is that a whole grain really is 
it's not optimal. And especially for those of you who are in here who are CrossFitters, like you're looking for optimal ways to feed yourself. You're looking for how to feed yourself the best way so that you can live your life the best way so that you can come in here and PR every day. You know what I mean? Like you want to, you want the best kind of food. So uh, grains just aren't optimal. Everything's sucked out of them and, and nothing's really put back in them except calories, which aren't energy unless they're, they're nutri unless they're, they're nutritious too. So, um, another sort of interesting fact is that our body can actually manufacture glucose for our bloodstream from protein and from fat, which means that there is literally zero dietary requirement for carbohydrate. You can live indefinitely off of protein and fat because our body can take that protein and fat and it can convert it in our bodies into simple sugars. Um, so there is no need from a survival standpoint for carbohydrate. From a nutrition standpoint and from a micronutrient standpoint, there are things found in carbohydrates that you can't get anywhere else, but it is not, it's not a life or death situation. But for optimal, for optimal health, of course you need your fruits and your vegetables. Uh, now, soy, and I'm gonna touch on uh, the other things, like, because what, what a lot of people hear when they talk about the paleo diet is no grains, no beans, no soy, um, no dairy, and, and I'm going to talk about those real briefly. Um, beans are sort of the same thing. Listen, I'm not going to fight you on beans. Nobody got, nobody's ever gotten fat off black beans. It just it hasn't happened. Um, black beans, beans in general, um, they're, they're sort of the same way that, that grains are. They're not optimal. Um, there's a lot of things in them that resist our digestion of them. So they're not gonna feed you as well as, as well as any natural carbohydrate because of all that you have to do to them to be able to eat them and all that they fight you when you eat them. Soy promotes estrogen production, production in the body. Um, they're recognized as estrogen. Any soy product um, is recognized as estrogen in the body. So your body responds that way. Um, and any kind of intake of, of something that your body perceives as a sex hormone is is just like, it's a, it's a gamble. I mean, you don't know what your body's gonna do to it as far as testosterone and estrogen production. Um, peanuts, same thing. Peanuts are a bean. Um, they're not a nut, they're mis mislabeled. Um, but they fall into the same category as beans. Um, dairy, here's, here's the interesting thing about dairy. Dairy is the perfect food for humans that are zero to two years old and only if that dairy comes from their mother. Beyond that, there's no need for dairy. We get, I mean, dairy is not just, it's not just macronutrients. It's not just protein, carbohydrates, and fat. It is hormonal signals. It is powerful signals that if we are getting the signals that a mother cow intended for her calf, it just doesn't make sense to take, to take another animal's breast milk and drink it or eat it in whatever form it comes in. It just, it, it doesn't make sense. Just like we would never flip the script and feed human breast milk to a cow. It just, it wouldn't happen. So that's sort of the idea is that, that grain or that dairy is, dairy is meant for another animal. It's not, it's not something that we, we process well. Some people have real, real, real resistance to dairy. Some people can do okay with it. Part of this is really sort of doing your own homework and testing out what works for you. So if you, if you can hang with dairy, um, most of the protein that you get is whey protein. That's a dairy derivative. Um, and it, it tends to be okay. You know, if, if you're all right with it, cool. If you're not okay with it, obviously stay away from it. So um, dairy sort of, dairy sort of hit or miss. From a practical standpoint, here's, here's what you can do. You eat. Meat, vegetables, nuts, seeds, some fruit, little starch, and no sugar. You keep intake. levels that support exercise
but not body fat. It's that simple. That's it. That's, that is the, the shortest way to say everything you have to say. Anything other than that is extraneous information. That is as cut and dry as I can make it. You eat meat, vegetables, nuts and seeds, some fruit, little starch and no sugar, and keep intake to levels that support exercise but not body fat, you're healthy. You're able to perform. Your, your nutrition levels are going to be right where they need to be. You're going to be able to perform everything that you need to do, and, and you're going to be good to go. Now, the, the next step, sort of the next level down, is eating whole foods. The closer we can get to the way a food is found in nature, the better it is for us. So the less I can do to my food and the closer I can get to the ground it was dug out of, the better it is for me. So think about this. If, if a food, take, take any fruit or any packaged canned fruit, why would fruit be good for months? Like that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for, for me to be able to open up a can of peaches that's been sitting in my pantry for a year and a half and cook with it and eat it. That's a peach. It grew on a tree. Like it's, that, that sucks. Like, I mean, really, like that's, that's bad. You know, I mean, like the, it shouldn't happen that way. Food has expiration dates. Products have labels. So if you're looking at what you're about to eat and you see a label or packaging on it, that means that something happened to it. Something happened to it along the way, aside from, aside from picking it out of the ground or off the tree or off the vine that it grew on and putting it in your hand. You look at the produce section at, at the grocery store, and you might have heard this before, if you stay to the outside of your grocery store, if you don't go down the aisles, I mean, if you need to get laundry detergent, whatever, but like, if you stay, like if you stay around the outside of the grocery store, then, then you're good. Because you walk in and what's on the outside here is like your produce and your deli, and then your, your milk, if you wanna go that, down that route, and eggs, and then like your frozen stuff on the outside. Um, now, for the sake of convenience, fresh, is greater than frozen, is greater than canned. Um, a lot of times foods that are frozen, like you can't always have fresh fruit around. I understand that. Uh, I can't tell you how many vegetables and fruits I've thrown away because I forgot about them. But frozen fruits are more convenient. If you've got frozen foods, typically they're flash frozen, which lets them keep a lot of the nutrients that they have. So that's pretty good for you. Um, when Coach Glassman, who founded CrossFit, when he, when he designed this whole thing, and sort of this makes sense after hopefully what we've talked about, he designed it with a pyramid. And what the pyramid was, was five different levels of increasing difficulty and increasing specificity, where at the bottom is nutrition, Strength and conditioning is right above that. Above that is gymnastic movement. Above that is Olympic lifting, and then above that is sport or skill specific. So basically what that means is that I'm not gonna be able to condition myself as well as I possibly could if my nutrition's off base. And if my strength and conditioning is terrible, I'm not gonna be able to do a muscle up. I'm not gonna be able to do a pull up. If I can't do a pull up and my strength and conditioning isn't where it's supposed to be and my nutrition is terrible, I'm not gonna be able to snatch as much as I could or clean and jerk as much as I could. And if I can't do all of that stuff, I'm gonna be less, less proficient, less effective at the sport or skill that I'm trying to, to, to optimize my ability at. Whether that sport or skill is football or whether it's parenting. I mean, like, it's, and I'm not saying that being able to clean and jerk more weight makes you a better mother. I'm saying that, like, that your ability to do all this stuff makes you better at, at the things that you do every day. I'm saying that, that if, if this is off base, then all of this gets screwed up. So this is like, I mean, this is foundational. It's, it's so, so, so important. Um, so 
a couple of couple more takeaways, and then I'm actually I'm finishing up, and I can open it up for questions. Um, fat doesn't make you fat. We talked about that. Dietary fat doesn't equal body fat. I, like I hate that they're that they're called the same thing. I hate that that what we eat is called fat and what we store around our midsection is called fat because that leads people to believe that like if I eat a lot of body fat or if I eat a lot of dietary fat, I'm gonna, it's gonna convert to body fat. It doesn't happen that way. Body fat is, is stored as a long burning energy and it's, it's, it, it, it doesn't happen that way. So um, the, the medical problems in America, the obesity, the hypertension, all the, the, the heart problems that are, are derivatives of that, the diabetes, those are all caused by an, a high glycemic load Lots of blood sugar, lots of insulin, which leads to diabetes, which leads, I mean, diabetes is way down the road, but like, but it's not by excess fat. So eat lots of almonds, eat lots of avocados. Like that's, that's good for you. Um, sort of from a, a meal planning standpoint, start a meal with a high quality protein source. Hopefully one that ate what it was supposed to eat. Any, any animal that ate what it was supposed to eat. And you see grass fed chicken? Chickens don't eat grass. Chickens eat bugs and like, I don't know, whatever. Chickens aren't picky. Like, so there are certain things that, like, you have to do your research on, on what an animal actually eats. So people hear these buzzwords and it's, it's all marketing, like grass fed, oh, it must be healthy, like organic, doesn't really mean much. Like calling, calling a chicken all natural, like I hope so. Like, you know what I mean? Like, what, what's the alternative to that? You know, like I don't see a lot of chickens walking around with prosthetic legs. You know what I mean? Just like, it's it, all natural doesn't mean anything. It just means that at one point it was alive. Like, so that's, that's really kind of it. But start your meal with a high quality protein source, surround it with vegetables. If you want a snack, eat some nuts, eat some fruit. And that's kind of it. Like that's that's the the method to it. And when you break it down, it's really pretty simple. And it just sort of like it, it, anybody who's done this and, and sort of start started eating paleo, it, it, they get traction with it. You know, like and it, if you fall off the wagon, the good news is that you're gonna have another meal, like soon probably. Like a lot of y'all probably go home now and eat. So. Like that's your next chance, you know. And if you fall off, then you're probably gonna have another meal after that. But it's the it's the long term picture. It's the uh, the decisions that I make, sort of as an aggregate of all of my choices, is where I end up down the road, you know. And if I have if I have that carb or that you know that's, that sugar or whatever it is, um, I had fudge yesterday at work. It was awesome. It was really good. Like, but I didn't have any today, and I won't have any for a while. You know, what I mean, it was just sort of like it's it's decisions for your, the sake of your sanity. You know, I mean, there's, you shoot for 100%, you meet at 80%, and you're 80% better off than you were when you started, you know? So, um, with that said, you, you sort of get the, the resistance, when I talk to people about this, you sort of get the resistance that it's a fad diet. It's not a fad diet. A fad diet is something that shows up for six to eight weeks, they tell you to eat as much grapefruit as you can, and then you lose a ton of weight. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't happen that way. It fluctuates too much. If this is a fad diet, then like it's a two million year old fat. Like this, that sort of beats the, the fat word. So um, this is, it's sustainable. It's something you can do for a long time. It's something that you can, you can live a lifestyle with. So um, I'm not trying to sell you on convert now and, you know, and then see where you are in eight weeks and then jump right back off the wagon. Like this is, this is something you can do, you know, and, and it's something that, especially being in here, you have the opportunity to be around other people who are doing it too. And you know, with this challenge going on, um, it's something that, that you're going to see a lot of people sort of starting to try. And there's resources all over the place in here. You know, people who are doing it, people who are good at it, and people who have sort of figured out tricks um, to it.